All right, we're going to have two awesome people, and uh, we're going to do uh, Coin Stories, which is uh, Natalie's podcast, and it's going to be a nice back and forth fireside chat. All right, we're going to put 25 minutes on the clock, and you guys are all set. All right, so let's just do quick introductions, first of all. Um, so my name is Natalie Brunel. I host the Coin Stories podcast, and I'm a former broadcast journalist or recovering mainstream news journalist that is now focusing all of my energy on Bitcoin content, Bitcoin education, and just trying to um, spread the message on why Bitcoin is amazing. Not mass adoption, though. <laughs> um, and really excited because Coin Stories is sort of like a human interest driven podcast. So I get people's whole backstories. So they're very evergreen in the sense that even though I talk about like headline driven aspects of Bitcoin, I really get the person's backstory starting at like, you know, where was Michael Saylor born and what did he want to be when he grew up? So I'm excited to hear your story. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm Justin Redrick, uh, go by Bitcoin Vegan. Um, I'm also the author of From Bars to Bitcoin, where I tell my story coming into Bitcoin and uh, coming home from prison into Bitcoin. I'm also a moderator in a group called Black Bitcoin Billionaires, where we create a group of up to about 150,000 members on Clubhouse, educating people around the world on about Bitcoin. Um, for my generation and age, I probably influence a good percentage of people on Bitcoin throughout the years. And uh, we'll get into a little bit more of that story right about now. Awesome, okay, so I read that you're from North Carolina and I saw that actually your father's a reverend. No, that wasn't That's my not dad. <laughs> no, nah, my dad isn't, my granddaddy was. Granddad, okay, so mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your upbringing. What was the young Justin like? Uh, long, young Justin was wild, um, smart, kind of, like hard-headed, but you know, it was, me as a younger child, it was cool. I did have a lot of incidences of, you know, fighting with, you know, just being a boy, but um, early on it was, it was pretty cool from what I could notice. I talk a lot about like my background just being in first generation, there were a lot of financial struggles. Was that the case like with you? I mean, what did your parents do and what was your relationship with money when you were young? So that's the thing, like, so I didn't really notice what my relationship with money was when I was that young. Um, my dad, I didn't start, my dad didn't start living with us until I was like seven, so it was just me and my mother. But I really started realizing what our financial situation was in 2006 when, um, when we lost our house during to the, to the early parts of the housing market crash. So that's when I realized, I was like, uh, something's not adding up. Like, people are working, but, you know, why, why are things, you know, that's when things just started clicking. So I was like, and um, I was, that was my senior year in high school, so I wasn't really tied into financial education as I should have been, but that was a big eye opener then. Well, so you, your family lost your house. You were curious mm -hmm. about why the heck that happened. But then you went to college and then dropped out, right? Because of something mm -hmm. that happened with your mom, what happened? So, like, really, it was a lot more stuff than just that with my mom. Um, we were going around from house to house. Um, I actually transferred to a different school and wasn't able to play basketball. And then I witnessed that one of my friends get killed at a party. And so it was a lot of, uh, like, just down. I just I didn't really know how much of a downward spiral I was in. And so I did go to college. And college was cool, but I didn't. I wasn't focused at college. I just went to college to get up out of the uh, environment. And what's crazy is I actually, I actually made the dean's list the the semester before I dropped out of college. But I dropped out of college because I really felt like I was um, I was getting played. Um, the professor put up a graph, and it was like 2009, and he said, uh, "Yeah, you won't be able to get a job until 2015, 2016 in your field." And no one in the class thought that was an issue. And so I just raised my hand. I said, but y'all, but Sally Mae is going to start knocking on the door for money six months after graduation. So why the hell are we sitting in here? And no one just, <laughs> no one actually thought that was a problem. And granted, I know in college I smoked a lot of weed and did a lot of partying, but I knew that shit didn't really add up. So... I mean, it's, it was something to clap about, but the, the, 
it wasn't the best decision because I didn't have a plan after I dropped out of college. And then that led to worse decisions. So. Yeah, take us down that road. Tell us that story. <laughs> I mean, obviously from bars to Bitcoin. So let's yeah. go to from dropping out of college to bars. How did you end up in prison? So um, I ended up in prison because I was just hanging out in the streets trying to find ways to make money. I tell a lot about this story in the book. Um, but like even in college, we would drive down to Atlanta to go buy weed for my cousin to bring back to sell in North Carolina just because it was cheaper. But um, what ended up happening was I got home and things just weren't getting better. Like, and I did not know how to, like I saw things, but you'd be surprised about how information not being delivered correctly can impact a path. So um, I just told the story to somebody. So a friend of mine was telling me there was a guy who he was scamming people. He had money and cash. I was like, all right, so what are we going to do? He said, well, we're just going to go in there and basically rob him. Um, so we actually did it, but no money was there. And I really realized, like, God damn, I'm on a big dummy mission. So I left. Um, they got arrested. And then a month or so later, I got arrested. And then that whole process started for me to go to prison for three years. And it was in prison. I was like, damn, I'm fucked. But um, I looked at it as even though it was about to be a very long process, I was still looking to try to find a way to win you know, in life because I realized a lot of people had hit rock bottom and still found a way to succeed. So the only thing was you had to have a will to win. And that's why I just kept. I've always had that as a child. Um, I was always had a fighting spirit, and I just knew that I would try to find a way to win. And um, it was when I came home, I did some entrepreneurial things. I became vegan um, in 2015, and I used to cook food, deliver it out my house. But it wasn't until my friend Isaiah Jackson, um, author of Bitcoin of Black America, I've been actually knowing him since I was 11 years old. Um, he taught me about Bitcoin, and I would sit in the basement of my mom's house studying Bitcoin every single day. Um, I remember going out in my neighborhood, setting up wallets for people for like $25. Um, I used to, hell, I even used to sell Bitcoin before the federal government made it illegal. Um, because people didn't know what Bitcoin ATMs were or where they were located. So I said, well, damn, I'll sell you some Bitcoin. I'm like, yeah, how much? I said, well, I'm like, well, if the ATM at the charge this time, like 12.8%, I'm like, man, I'll do you for 25%. Just give me $25, I'll give you $100 of Bitcoin. So I would go to the ATM, buy it, send them the 20, uh, send them the 100, have the 25, just collect sets. Um, and this was in 2016, so Bitcoin's around 600 some odd dollars. And um, I just realized that Bitcoin, I knew Bitcoin could win when every single person on the planet could win. It didn't matter if you were black, white, if you hated each other or loved each other, everybody could win. So it was built in a way that I could understand because in um, the one thing that stood out was how Zay said it was decentralized, so in prison, and the name of the conference is called Unconfiscatable. So in prison, um, I said a little bit uh, yesterday, we had stamps. And so using stamps in prison helped me understand how decentralized currencies could work amongst humans. Um, you didn't, and you didn't really have to have any pre-knowledge to, to it. You just had to be in an environment where it worked. So. That's why I see Bitcoin succeeding. It's kind of like when you are 18 years old or 20 years old, you go to the military, and then people are in basic training for like six to eight months, but you come home with all this damn discipline. It's like you should start adapting to where you are. So um, that's all I think I knew how to do when I came home was adapt. And I said, hell, um, I heard people say they lost a lot of money with Bitcoin. They said, um, they said, um, you know, you need to figure out what you're going to do. Don't do this, do that. I'm like, there's nothing for me to lose. Like, shit, I've already lost the time. 
So it was nothing more than just to take a shot. And so um, on top of that, that's why I really feel, and I didn't really understand this part, but the reason I have a lot of faith in Bitcoin or my conviction is hard in Bitcoin is because Bitcoin solved the problem that affected my life. The, uh, like, the housing market crash, our house foreclosure. I didn't know that shit till just a few minutes ago. And somebody asked me, they were like, so, like, do you go all in on Bitcoin? Like, yeah. It's like, if Bitcoin was to go to zero, shit, we still got we still would have a better performing money than the U.S. dollar. <laughs> You'll have unconfiscatable money that wouldn't go nowhere in price that's still decentralized, so it's still a win. Uh, but it's just like, you know, it's kind of like that General Hannibal said, you know, we take the island, we're going to burn the boat. So shit is like if Bitcoin goes down, shit it just it just is what it is because it's the only opportunity zone that even exists today. Like even if you don't support Russia or you do or whatever it is, the fact that they've been kicked out of the SWIFT banking system and the only thing they can do is use Bitcoin, is like shit, it's, it doesn't matter what side you're on. And what's crazy is it's going to be very interesting just to see how the whole space moves forward once your favorite enemy is now hodling Bitcoin. Wow, that was incredible. Um, so my family also lost everything in that crash. Yo, so wait, yeah, my, I, I didn't mean to do that. Let me. No, I relate to you. Um, I think that's why, like Bitcoin, you know, it speaks to people in different ways because of our own individual experiences, but yet we all have this common thread where it's something about justice, right, at the end of the day. And we have a lot of headlines out there about social justice or reforming the justice system, but what really would reform it, in probably both our opinions, is fixing the money, right? Fixing the money because it's broken. So um, when you now spread education, like what's the biggest hurdle that you find in terms of helping people go down the rabbit hole in the same way that Isaiah sort of led you down and orange pilled you and helped you understand like what's the thing that you really that really challenges you and that you want to help people understand about Bitcoin well like it challenged me a lot but now it's like challenging the whole space a bit because um, like one thing that's, that helped me in the beginning was all right I can learn the information but how do I teach it so for years, I used to operate from a selfish thought of the conversation of thinking like, well, you need to get it because I get it, so I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna talk to you the way I understand it. So it's like I'm talking German, I mean, I'm talking English to someone who talks German, and they're looking at me like, what the fuck are you saying? So what I really realized was like, and um, like you know how we say the shit corners, Oh, they're great at marketing. They have great marketing. We don't need marketing. We sell ourselves. Bitcoin sells itself. No, the hell it doesn't. Because most people don't even know how to buy. Who's in sales in here? By show of hand, who's in sales? Yeah, okay. Well, don't worry. Nobody's going to think you're going to sell them something. But the <laughs> thing is, is like, you know that people don't know how to buy shit. You have to take them down the path. You have to help them understand get over objections. That's the same thing with Bitcoin. So like you, the thing I noticed is like, like granted, we have the same numbers. 99% of the world knows shit about Bitcoin. So everybody, when you talk to them, they're gonna have the same type of, oh, well, I'm too late. Oh my God, the price is too high. I heard the price is volatile or scams. They're gonna all say the same type of stuff. So if you don't know how to answer that question in a language they understand, those numbers of 99% will always stay the same. Um, it's like we got to take it to another level of the conversation of introduction to another level. Otherwise, like the whole conference has been saying, they're going to keep listening to folks on Capitol Hill about Bitcoin. 
They're going to keep going to KYCs. They're going to keep going to the AMLs. They're going to keep going to all the other stuff because, like, we are thinking in a language that only we understand. So, like, earlier, and it was a great answer. Earlier I asked um, the panel who's doing the mass adoption of payments, you know, how were they educating the people? Well, they have to educate the people in the industry they serve, but you still have to find a way to educate the people who you, on the other side of the equation. So, like, one of the things that um, me and Bitcoins they are creating in Miami, like I have a project called the From Bars to Bitcoin Project, where the entire initiative is to educate returning citizens on Bitcoin. So they could be, you know, in those same type of conversations or use the skills to build a job for themselves or, you know, be an entrepreneur. But at the end of the day, it's 2 million people locked up, uh, 600,000 come home per year. And those are users. At the end of the day, Bitcoin is going to need users. Like any other tech needs users. It's not just all about who has the most Bitcoin. It's all about users. Like if you look at how apps are judged, YouTube has 10 billion downloads. That's more than the humans are on the planet. So the more users and value, you know, that's how I look at it. Bitcoin has bought this value. You got to always look at how you recycle and bring value to the network of Bitcoin. If you feel it's really done this much for you or done this much, you have to find a way to add value. And talking about, you know, just being able to talk about it to yourself isn't that. But that's why I think. Well, I think value can be, there are universal values, but also value can be very subjective. And I have found that when I offer the message of Bitcoin, I have to cater it depending on the audience, mm -hmm. right? So it's a different value proposition maybe for liberals versus conservatives versus boomers versus minority communities. So maybe f can you speak to black America and why it's important for, for their success? I mean, Shit, it's the, uh, like I said before, it's the only opportunity zone for black America. Um, I really see it like it's the only option out there. Um, I mean, really, the only option. There's no, there's no overseer. Nobody really on this planet has ever lived in a moment where you have experienced non-manipulated money until now. Um, 100% of black people on this planet have never experienced the opportunity with no overhead oppression. So um, that's the opportunity that Bitcoin brings. And it can, you know, we can talk about the money, the Bitcoin, the, the, the value, but it's all about opportunity. Like what opportunities can you bring? You know, if you have to really get it off of your own work ethic with no one standing there, then what are you going to bring? How are you going to rise to the occasion? Because you're not going to be able to sit around and no one's going to give a damn about, you know, how you're talking about it. There will be people, but you have to you have to you have to take action on it and that's the only way I see it happening in Bitcoin. You can go to shitcoin land if you want to, but <laughs> we already know you're going to end up with that one. So, it's um it's really the only opportunity that I see. Other than telling yourself to buy Bitcoin, if you could have a conversation with the Justin who was walking into that prison for the first time, what would you tell him? You'd be all right, keep going. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's because if I say anything else, it'll fuck up the ending. <laughs> you know, I, I probably wouldn't be on this stage right now. Hell, if I graduated college, I'd probably be in the shit corner, so we we good where we are. <laughs> All right, well, some people out here would say that being vegan is a shit coin, so I'm going to ask a tough question. Vegan, yeah, why, why are you vegan? There are so many carnivores in here. Man, hey, I'm glad that I'm here, matter of fact. So I think I got here because I put out a tweet. I said, who created the Bitcoin carnivore narrative? And then someone said it was safe, Dean. It was safe, Dean. So I, I tweeted something that's safe, Dean. And he said, oh, well, you need to read my book. And I was like, well, damn it, hell, read mine. But um, it was a funny... It was a funny little weekend. I saw the whole, I think it was just like a dead weekend at Bitcoin. I was like, we should just throw this shit out here and see what happens. So then Tone asked me on Telegram, you want to come to Unconfiscated? I'm like, yeah, sure. I look at the website, I'm like, did he try me on purpose? Like, they have a whole dead ass animal on here talking about carnivore dinner. I was like, yeah, I'll be here though. It's all good. I'll be here. Um, but it was funny to me, man. Um, 
I've been vegan just as long as I've been Bitcoin. Um, and what's funny is I've heard, like, for the past six years, just crazy, um, you know, oh, you're vegan, this, that, and third, blah, blah, blah. Then you hear it with Bitcoin. And you just end up being this hardened person of, like, not giving a damn about either side of the conversation. So it's just, but I got, I, I was really in vegan because, um, because I saw freedom in the food. I just I always saw freedom. Wherever I see freedom, for me personally, I'm going to go there. Um, taking myself off the standard diet. One day I was, like, with my one girlfriend at the time. I ate crazy the whole damn week. Lost my six-pack, lost everything. I was just like, no, nah, I don't want to live like this. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to change. And then, like, in, in my family or community, people just have bad health. And it's like, you're not really paying attention what the hell you do every day. So um, it was just it was just a big. I just wanted to break away from everything that I felt had anything to do with me going to prison and just be a whole new new person or a new just a new new path of life. How did being in prison change your view on freedom and just how important it is? And I mean, taking it one step further, obviously you would probably value money that that represents freedom, right? Mm-hmm. Uh. Sh- being in a situation where you have to listen to people who you are know are stupid than you is is painful. <laughs> like it, that's a different level of pain to where you were looking like I really have to. Do, I mean, I don't have to, but it's like it's probably my best interest to listen to you, and it's just like, damn, I really have to go through this. So, um, but you know, the whole being away from your family stuff um, that's rough. Not being able to see women is rough. Um, that that was terrible. Um, but it just makes you think like, whatever opportunity there is out there, you have to like go for it. Um, I told somebody, hell, I'd rather sleep on a bridge than do this shit because there's our chance. You know, there's our chance. As long as you have a chance that you could do something, there's really like small chance. You're almost like negative chances. So. Um, just to be able to wake up and go at it again. You fucked up one day, you go at it again. You know, you might do this for months, but you have that opportunity to do it over. So that's um, that's something you don't really have in prison. Well, to start to land the plane here, I'm just kind of curious. We always say Bitcoin fixes this, right? And we mean everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it fixes families, it fixes the economy, it fixes, you know, politics. How does Bitcoin fix the criminal justice system. So, like, what part are we talking about? Are we talking about, like, them going to prison or well, coming what's, home? What's, I guess what's your hope? Like, if we all adopt Bitcoin and that's the new standard and our money, in theory, goes up in value every year and allows us to kind of recreate the financial order in a way that's more equitable and has more economic opportunity and access to opportunity, how do you think that will impact, maybe in a positive way, the criminal justice system? Um, what do you want to see. see based right, on your I mean, experience? So what I would want to see is like, I think, like I said, again, it would probably have to start with why they should be good actors because like we can, we can say that, um, like there's still going to be crime. Um, going to be all the way honest. It's still going to be crime. It might be a lower level of crime, but I mean, the dark web still exists today. Um, Bitcoin has been going up in price. Um, I think that I think, but what will happen is you people will that overhead again would be gone, and you'll have like less numbers, and then you have folks who really just like just want to be that feel like this is what they have to do for their whole life. Some people, most people are in prison because they don't have money. Um, so you flip a lot of that, you'll just start you'll start seeing things unravel slowly. But I can't. There won't just be this perfect utopia of no crime, but. Um, I think you will start seeing a lot less because people might have more opportunities to do the life they really want to live. Awesome. Well, I think we're out of time, but that was an amazing story. Thank you. I don't know if anyone has questions, but we've got like a minute. (laughs) 